published 1811 EDT, the 18th of October 2017, updated 2020 EDT, the 18th of October 2017. Sarah Pullen always longed for a little girl, but was very happy with her gang of four healthy, strapping, boisterous sons. Born over the space of five years, they resembled a pack of playful, rambunctious puppies and family life passed in a blur of rugby, cricket, climbing trees, cycling, and hurtling down zip wires. Rackets, bats, balls, and muddy boots burst from every cupboard of the red brick Victorian rectory Sarah shared with husband Ben, a film producer, and their golden, ruddy boys on the North Downs of Kent. Giving up her career as an investment banker in London to be a full-time mum, Sarah, 47, often marveled at her luck, even if she sometimes had to yell at the top of her voice to bring her exuberant brood to heel, or yank them apart when play fighting spiraled out of control. Son number one, Oscar, was the strong-willed one. Son number two, Rufus, was the shy, thoughtful one. Son number three, Silas, was the sunny, happy-go-lucky one. And son number four, Anigo, was the sweet, spoilt baby of the family. Pictured from left to right Oscar, Rufus, Sarah, Silas, Ben and Anigo Pullen in 2013 when I was pregnant with Silas, I was told at the first scan I was having a girl, and was very excited, buying pink sparkly things, says Sarah, who put them away when a second scan confirmed another boy. He arrived, weighing a massive 11 pounds and with a shock of deep red hair. Ben took one look and said what a mighty boy and he was. All his measurements were off the scale. Of all my sons, he seemed the most robust. Silas was the one I never really worried about. He was so big and full of life, unstoppable. Today, Sarah's gang of four is reduced to three and her eyes brim with tears for her lost child, Silas, who, like Peter Pan, remains in her mind an eternal child who will never grow up. Her third son died at home aged 11, sandwiched between his heartbroken parents in their bed, on December 29, 2013, less than 18 months after being diagnosed with a rare, 250,000 tune form of brain cancer for which there was no cure. Lost in a fog of despair, Sarah, who felt like she was drowning in grief, poured her feelings onto paper as a way of coping. Silas was just 11 years old when he died, he was surrounded by his family at home she started writing for herself and never expected anyone to read her words except her husband and sons. I wanted our boys to know our journey, to be able to capture Silas again, one day down the line when they can no longer remember him, but it also forced me to confront my grief, says Sarah. But when Ben read what I'd written, he said you should do something with this. The result is A Mighty Boy, a searing account of one mother's lonely journey through the kind of nightmare every parent dreads. Sarah hopes her book will raise awareness and bring comfort to others forced to tread the same path, for ultimately her story is one of love, strength, survival and a touching humor and camaraderie between Silas, his parents and siblings, which helped the family cope in the most devastating of circumstances. When Silas was born at 11 pounds, Ben took one look at him and said what a mighty boy Silas has left a huge gap in our family. I think about him every hour of every day, but it's up to me as a mother to give something back to my other three sons, forge a new kind of family life without Silas, she says. We never told him he was dying. Instead, we used to call the tumor Bob and talked about how Wed beat Bob into submission. After he died, I remember an ego asking me will you and daddy ever be happy again and I told him yes, I think so, but perhaps it will be a different kind of happiness, adds Sarah, who is donating all the proceeds from book sales to brain cancer research. About 5,000 under-18s die every year in the UK. The compassionate friends support parents. Go to tcf.org.uk Sarah's voice quavers as she recalls the perfect Sunday in August 2012 when Silas, then aged 10, first complained of a headache. At one point it was so bad he begged his mother I need to go to the hospital. Please, please, I feel like I'm dying. Sarah was torn between a mother's instinct telling her something was badly wrong, and the rational adult voice insisting that such a strong, healthy boy couldn't possibly be seriously ill. In an agonizing decision, Sarah and Ben did and tell Silas or his brothers that he was dying. She gave Silas a painkiller and told him to lie down on the sofa, checking for symptoms of meningitis but finding none. Silas quickly rallied and within half an hour was back knocking cricket balls for six in the garden. That evening, when Sarah asked, What do you want for supper? Darling Silas struggled to reply. He stuttered, the words wouldn't come out. Sarah called an ambulance. By the time they reached their local A, Silas' heart rate was dropping to 40 BPM. A scan revealed an aggressive tumor the size of a tennis ball, invading his brain like the tentacles of an octopus. The diagnosis was brutal. Silas would die, very quickly without any treatment, and within two years, despite surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy, 
Sarah's first, shocking visceral reaction to her son's terminal diagnosis was to wish her son dead for him to have been killed instantly in a car crash. The family still keeps Isla's memory alive, here they are pictured on a family holiday she couldn't bear the thought of watching him suffer. Her distraught husband Ben, 48, meanwhile, told Sarah he wished had never met her. Of course it hurt, but he didn't mean it and I totally understood, says Sarah, who describes Ben, her husband of almost 20 years, as her rock. The thought of losing Silas was just as terrible for him as it was for me. It was the only way he could express it. If we'd never met, we'd never have had children together, then he would not have had to watch one of them die, I had no idea there was still cancer which was untreatable. I had no idea that brain cancer kills more children than meningitis. Silas was transferred to King's College Hospital in London for emergency brain surgery. It was here that doctors broke the terrible news that he had a high-grade glioblastoma multiform GBM, a fast-growing cancerous tumor which infiltrates healthy brain tissue. When a doctor says the word cancer, you immediately think oh, there's lots we can do, this, that and the other, says Sarah. I had no idea there was still cancer which was untreatable. I had no idea that brain cancer kills more children than meningitis. I couldn't accept that there was no cure for Silas, but we were told from the start he would die. There were no trials to go on. The drugs they used to treat brain cancer hadn't advanced in 40 years. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Surgeons managed to remove 70% of Silas' brain tumor during that first operation, but feared leaving him paralyzed if they tried to remove it all. Silas was remarkably brave but embarrassed by the S-shaped scar on his parts haven head, and hid his ordeal from others with a hat when he returned home. Sarah, meanwhile, spent grim hours on the internet researching the condition. Sarah was told right from the start that Silas would die and that there was no treatment she contacted brain cancer experts all over the world, pressing for complete tumor removal when she discovered that would give the best prognosis, but, ultimately, she had to accept that the cancer couldn't be beaten. From that point on, radiotherapy and chemotherapy centered on prolonging his life without compromising its quality. Sarah and Ben agreed they would not tell Silas or his brothers that he was dying, they decided not to lie to Silas, if he asked, but they would not force him to confront his own death. They kept it secret from all but their closest family and friends. It took all their strength to maintain a positive front, making light of the seriousness of what was happening, talking constantly of the future and how they'd beat Bob into submission. Early in his treatment, we were looking at a book of pictures drawn by cancer patients and Silas asked, what happened to them? I said, I guess they died, and Silas said, I don't want to die. I'm not going to die, am I? I told him, that's why we are doing this treatment, says Sarah. I did and he lie, but I chose not to go further down that path and he never asked again. I think he must have suspected and sometimes I wish I'd opened that door wide for him, but I think it would have frightened him. Gradually as the tumor grew, his personality started to change and he lost bodily functions one Christmas past, then summer. Treatment held the tumor at bay. Watching Silas eating ice cream on the beach, Sarah could almost pretend he had no cancer at all. That autumn, scans told a different story. The tumor was growing again. Silas lost the use of his right hand, he listed when he walked and his whole personality started to alter. Forgetful as dementia advanced, his toddler-like behavior grew selfish, mean or explosive. Ben and Sarah had no choice but to tell his brothers, separately in age-appropriate ways. Once they knew what was happening, they couldn't have shown Silas more love, support and compassion, says Sarah. Christmas arrived and Sarah realized with a bang that the end was nearing. As she decorated the tree, Silas' eyes were fixed, on the distance, as if he were already preparing to leave them. Heartbroken, Sarah and Ben decided it was time to let Silas go and told doctors they were stopping chemotherapy. Silas passed away shortly after Christmas, his funeral was on January 6, 2014. Their last conversation with Silas took place 10 days before his death at the family home. I love you Splodge, said Ben kissing his cheeks. I really love you Daddy, Silas replied. What about Mummy? Silas turned to his mother and said I really, really love you Mummy. Sarah rubbed his nose with hers and said ditto. Holding a thumb and forefinger a small distance apart, she added but just a smidge and more. The next day he, didnt get out of bed, didnt eat, he never really woke up again properly, says Sarah, who says they were supported by an amazing team of community nurses, who administered end-of-life palliative care. On the Wednesday before Silas died, Ben and I could hear our sons sitting on the bed next to each other. They were watching the film Home Alone and all laughing. By then Silas couldn't talk or communicate, but he could probably hear his brothers and that is a lovely thought.
Since Silas' death, she has raised £500,000 for brain cancer research in memory of her son after Silas passed away. Surrounded by his family, Oscar, Rufus and Inigo all wrote letters to put in his coffin, which they carried at his funeral on January 6, 2014. Silas' ashes were scattered under a tree in the garden. Nearly four years have passed since then, during which time the family has raised more than £500,000 for brain cancer research. Sarah's gang of three are growing up fast. They talk about Silas all the time to keep his memory alive. Head be 15 now. Oscar, 18, is planning to read history at university after a gap year, having achieved excellent A-level results. Rufus, 16, is celebrating a string of A results in his GCSEs, while Inigo, 12, is doing well in secondary school. Life goes on and there is much to look forward to. After Silas died I became so overprotective of the others, thinking I couldn't survive if it happened again, but you have to let children take risks, let them go and just live in the moment, says Sarah. The pain of losing a child never goes away, you just get better at carrying the burden. The grief comes in waves, then the waves start to come less often. At the very start of this journey my immediate reaction was to wish Silas dead. As a parent you'd throw yourself under a bus to save your child from suffering. But as impossible as it is to see your child in pain and fade away in front of you, I'd do this whole journey again just to have one more day with him to make more memories. A Mighty Boy A Mother's Journey Through Grief by Sarah Pullen Published by Unbound All proceeds will be donated to the Brain Tumor Charity, thebraintumorcharity.org.